Hi everybody, The Academic Leftist here, and in today's video I'm going to review a summary by a popular YouTuber who's a conservative libertarian who goes by the name of Actual Justice Warrior, and he's summarizing a debate he had with Ben Burgess and another YouTuber, Xander Hall, on the issue of poverty and crime, and he raises a number of points that conservative commentators tend to raise when discussing this issue, so I thought I'd go through a couple of these clips and then respond in kind. Okay, so let's get into it. So there was a point during the course of the debate where I didn't really want to argue this. I wanted to just accept their premise, like let's buy into the fact that poverty or income inequality or whatever is the number one cause of crime. That is the underlying cause, even though, as I've talked about multiple different times, there are periods of time where we had less income inequality, where we had higher rates of crime. There are periods of time where we've had more poverty overall and more income inequality overall, and we've had higher rates of crime. All those things have happened. A perfect example of this, and if you're one of those people who also likes to factor in racism, would be the 1950s versus the 1960s. People were poorer in the 50s. There was racism on the books in law in the 1950s, yet the black homicide rate, and blacks were poorer in the 50s, was lower than it was in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. So if you're blaming racism, if you're blaming poverty, then none of those actually appear to be factors. Now, if you're going with income inequality, it is true that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there was more income inequality than there was in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and crime was going up. However, during the course of the 2000s, we saw a crime drop, and that drop really started in the mid-90s, but we saw a crime drop while there was greater income inequality. So if income inequality is causing the crime, why does crime not appear to correlate with it? Okay, so he's saying a few things here. Number one, he's pointing out that in the United States, there have been periods of time where income inequality has increased and poverty has increased while violent crime has decreased and vice versa. So if you've seen my other videos, this actually shouldn't come as any surprise. There have been periods of time, as I mentioned, where income inequality especially increases, whereas violent crime sometimes increases, but also has decreased as well. And that's because there is not a very good association between income inequality and violent crime. The real association we want to look at here is between poverty and crime, specifically between concentrated poverty and violent crime. And this is another mistake he makes. He talks about periods of time where poverty has decreased and violent crime has increased. So he talks about how from the 1950s to the 1960s, poverty as a whole in the aggregate in the United States did substantially decrease, as we can see here. However, he doesn't take into account concentrated poverty, and that's the real variable of interest, as I've mentioned before. Now, We'll be, what is actually quite interesting here is when you take a look at this report by the U.S. Census Bureau from 1967, it points out that even though poverty decreased from the 50s to the 60s, the number of individuals residing in high poverty areas, areas with high concentrated poverty, was much greater in the cities in the late 1960s than it was in the suburban areas. And what's more fascinating, if you look at point number four here, the number of non-white families whose economic status put them above the poverty threshold were nonetheless far more likely to reside in high poverty areas than white families. This has serious implications for crime. What this shows is that African-American families who were above the poverty threshold in the United States in the 1960s were nonetheless residing in areas with high levels of concentrated poverty compared to their white counterparts. And this has implications in terms of their offspring and their children getting pulled into violent crime. The reason being is that if you reside in a high poverty area, even if you yourself are above the poverty threshold, you're residing in an area where the informal and formal social controls that tend to keep crime in check are nonetheless eroding. You're residing in an area with a low quality of education. You're residing in an area where you might have under-policing, which in the 1960s was a big problem caused by no small part institutional racism. And so there's an incentive to start engaging in illicit activities, to start engaging in crime, to preempt violent crime, etc. And so this is important. It shows why you can have a situation where even poverty, if it's decreasing in the aggregate, nonetheless, you have a situation where violent crime and homicides are increasing, as you know from my previous videos, was in fact taking place from the mid-1960s to the early 1990s. Okay, so let's look at the other clip. 
read and study more about the subject of criminal justice. So one of the things that I wanted to talk about is how this falls under what is called the underlying cause fallacy. The idea that the most efficient way to address a problem is to look for and identify the underlying cause and solve that underlying cause. So whether it's poverty or income inequality, the idea that that may lead to crime, therefore we must address income inequality or poverty is a little bit ridiculous because we know through practice, through bills, through legislation, through our own history, that having less tolerance from crime as a society, having stricter punishments and actually pursuing the criminals is a more efficient, both cost efficient and faster way to deal with crime. While we're trying to arrest poverty or arrest income inequality, we're letting crime and murderers run free, run rampant, even though that's no solution because we're looking for all these solutions to these underlying causes that are supposedly the problem. Think about Lyndon Bain Johnson's war on poverty. By the way, it coincides with an increase in crime, not a decrease in crime. All of that welfareism was meant to address these underlying causes. It was meant to deal with the historic racism that put black people in poverty. It was meant to deal with poverty and it was meant to deal with the inequality. During the course of that time when all those things were supposedly, allegedly, theoretically getting better, we saw dramatic spikes in crime, which again, we're not trying to argue root cause. Okay, so here he's saying a few things. Number one, I assume he's being inflammatory when he suggests that people on the left are talking about just allowing murderers and rapists and people who commit violent crimes to run rampant without actually, you know, engaging in any type of productive policy making. I've never heard anybody on the left make this argument. So clearly, yes, if violent crime is increasing, we should be vigilant and we should implement certain measures in the short term that try to alleviate or deal with that problem. But then he also says that excess policing and the construction of uh, prisons is more productive or more efficient uh, than dealing with the issue of high poverty. Well, efficient in what sense? It's certainly more cost efficient, at least from the standpoint of economic elites. And this is something that was brought up in my previous videos where I specifically cited a paper by two sociologists, Clegg and Usmani from the University of Chicago and Harvard University, who talked about the fact that constructing prisons and increasing the policing in high crime areas was more efficient from the standpoint of economic elites because it required a lower rate of taxation. It wouldn't have actually required a large redistribution of income simply because even though violent crime was increasing in the 1960s, the number of individuals who were engaging in such, in such crime was nonetheless a minority of Americans. So the denominator was quite small compared to those residing in high areas of poverty. And so it required less cost from the standpoint of economic elites. But is it more efficient overall? Well, no. Think about the hits to productivity and economic growth caused by violent crime over the long run. Think about the loss in manpower caused by high rates of incarceration and uh, policing, just in terms of productivity and people who can enter the labor force. And furthermore, think about how policing isn't a long-term solution. As I mentioned in my previous video, it's dependent on a certain degree of trust reciprocity and community building. When that trust breaks down because of things like unlawful activities by the police, because of killings, because of uh, riots, uh, well then policing breaks down as a proper mechanism for controlling violent crime. And as we're seeing now, uh, violent crime and gun crimes tend to be increasing in, in the last couple of years, specifically because of that deterioration and that erosion and trust between communities and between the police. So overall, there's no reason to believe that Policing and incarceration is more efficient in the aggregate than dealing with the long-term structural problems of concentrated poverty when it comes to alleviating violent crime. Now, he also talked about how Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty was taking place at a period of time when crime was increasing. Well, again, we can go back to that article by Usmani and Clegg who also mentioned this point. The war on poverty, it should be mentioned, was never sufficiently implemented by Johnson or successive administrations to really make a dent in concentrated poverty. It took place when, number one, the profit margins of major corporations in the United States was dropping because of competition from Germany and Japan. And furthermore, as a result of the type of Keynesian policies that were implemented historically in the United States, what some have called reactionary Keynesianism, meaning that uh, government only engaged in redistribution so long as economic growth was increasing and there was a higher absolute amount of tax revenues coming in, it's not a surprise that the war on poverty never really was 
sufficiently implemented. So while Johnson may have declared a war on poverty, the policies necessary to actually eradicate poverty and concentrated poverty were never really put in place. Furthermore, as this New York Times article uh, points out from the 1990s, the Johnson administration made a very conscious decision to direct most government expenditure towards the war in Vietnam as opposed to poverty alleviation. This is the classic guns and butter uh, dilemma and the Johnson administration never adequately put enough spending towards butter. He chose to divert most of government spending towards guns as a result of the Vietnam War. Secondly, successive administrations quickly scuttled the war on poverty. The Nixon administration, as I mentioned in a previous video, quickly declared a war on drugs and, you know, the war on poverty was forgotten and the 1970s was a period of stagnation and, you know, this was a time uh, when, of course, beginning with the Reagan administration after the Nixon administration, tax revenues were not only declining but with the Reagan administration's uh, uh, implementation of neoliberalism, tax rates actually were slashed for corporations and for uh, uh, individuals as well with the personal income tax decreases. And every administration since then, including Democrats under the Clinton administration, have made either cuts to welfare or have increased this trend towards uh, tax cuts for the wealthy and for individuals in general and for uh, corporations in the form of uh, reduced business taxes. We saw this with the Trump administration's uh, business tax cuts. So the war on poverty was never adequately implemented. So we can't point to that as really a failure when it comes to trying to alleviate long-term causes of uh, concentrated poverty and the long-term causes of uh, violent crime specifically. But even if you're under the misperception that any of the things that Burgess or Xander Holt actually caused crime, you can see how spending trillions of dollars trying to deal with the underlying cause doesn't necessarily have those immediate effects. And when you're talking about crime, when you're talking about things like homicide, when you're talking about these important things, you're talking about people's lives that are being lost. So we owe it to our own citizens to address these things in the most efficient way humanly possible. Okay, so here he says we owe it to individuals and to citizens to implement policies that eradicate crime very quickly. I've already gone over this. Uh, nobody is saying that policing should be terminated. Nobody serious on the left is actually saying that, that policing should be completely terminated before we've dealt with the long-term structural problems driving violent crime and nobody is saying that uh, people who engage in violent crime uh, shouldn't uh, be punished. What we are saying I think is that it's a far more efficient for society as a whole and more productive for society as a whole to, to not have the highest incarceration rate in the developed world and to not incarcerate such a large number of people uh, when you're trying to actually you know grow the economy and when you're trying to uh, hopefully from the standpoint of everybody implement the type of policies that would allow for prosperity to spread across neighborhoods and I just want to point to this one study by the Federal Reserve which was quite a promising study showing that things can be done in the short term that do reduce violent crime even without necessarily dealing with the problem of income redistribution so in this study what was done is a number of housing projects that would have concentrated a number of high poverty individuals in one area were terminated and these individuals were integrated into different neighborhoods in Chicago and what was found here was that simply integrating individuals below the poverty threshold into other neighborhoods, working class neighborhoods or higher income neighborhoods rather than concentrating them all in specific areas had a substantial and meaningful impact on the reduction of violent crime in Chicago. So this is just one of many policies that could be implemented even in the absence of a massive redistribution of income. So we don't have to actually keep turning to massive incarceration and policing to deal uh, with this problem. So hopefully that's answered uh, some of the questions people have when it comes to the mainstream conservative arguments on violent crime and poverty alleviation. And if AJW is watching this and you want to uh, continue the dialogue, I'm happy to do so. Okay, thank you.